Hey guys, this is the video. This is it. This is my best of 2020 list. Apologies that it took so long. I was trying to cram in as many movies as I could before the end of the year because let's be honest, 2020 was a odd year for film. I'm very curious to see what other people's lists are. Chris Stuckman put up one just recently. A lot of those movies I hadn't even heard of. That's going to be possibly a similar experience for you guys because obviously we weren't able to see as many movies in theaters, if any at all. The last one I saw in theaters was Tenant. I did go to the drive-in a couple of times, which was fun. But obviously this list is affected by not only theater release issues because up here in Canada, or at least in British Columbia, the theaters closed down in November, so I haven't been able to see anything that. And then there was also also a lot of weird limitations for Amazon video releases, which is stupid because I pay for Amazon Prime. I should be able to get the Amazon Studio movies because I pay for them. I put my money into them. And because 2020 was the strange odd year it was, I did get to see a lot of movies that I'd never seen before, even though they didn't come out this year. I still feel that they are worth recognizing because they are just such amazing movies. And I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of a heads up about them before we start the list. Last Breath, a must see documentary about a life and death situation with deep underwater diver cruise absolutely heart-stopping story come and see one of the few films I did see in theaters during COVID time. This is a harrowing look at the Nazi-Soviet Union conflict during the Second World War. Movie is absolutely soul-crushing while being incredibly innovative for its time. Howl's Moving Castle. I finally saw some Miyazaki movies and yes, they are great. This is my favorite one so far. Candyman. A truly different horror film experience from the odd time that was the 90s. Resonates even more with current world affairs now. Ready or not, wish I had seen this film last year. Damn, is it good and witty. Finally, Anne of Green Gables. This is a TV movie series from back in the 80s. God damn it, does this movie make me cry though. I get why Anne is such a beloved character in Canadian literature. For those of you who did watch my best of 2019, you know that there was a few movies that I did not get to see that year that would have been on the list. For instance, Parasite and Uncut Gems and 1917. Uncut Gems is a freaking fantastic movie. Parasite, you already heard all of the hype about that movie, but Uncut Gems was just an absolutely fantastic movie. 1917, Uncut Gems, and Parasite would have been my top three films of last year had I seen them. However, there is a little clause with one of those movies that it was technically released in full this year, so I'm going to include it because that is what you do when Disney screws with my list. I am putting it in because that's what I feel is the best. Before we start the list, let's do some honorable mentions. Mank. This was the first time David Fincher's been in the director's chair for a feature-length film in six years, and while it wasn't as stupendous and as groundbreaking as we thought it would be, it was still a pretty good period piece. It was still very reminiscent of the filming techniques of the 30s and 40s, and it was also a cool kind of eye-opener about Hollywood back in that time. Soul. Now, I'm not a big animated film guy. I have to admit that Pixar's animated film Soul was a very fun time. It was very grounded, and it had a lot more thought-provoking ideas than most of these films would. I feel this was much more generated towards young adults than children as most Pixar films are, and I definitely applaud it for that. The Five Bloods. This was Spike Lee's return to war since 2008 with that disaster that was Miracle at St. Anne. This was thankfully a lot better. It's a lot more grounded. It's a lot more personal. It's a lot more relevant to today. And despite it being a complete cluster in terms of how it was put together, it's actually a very well put together film and I did enjoy it. Now we start the list as I did last year. This is a best of seven because that is just what I'm going to do. There wasn't enough movies to put into 10. And honestly, I would have been kind of with it this year. So starting off with number seven is Underwater. I'm surprised this is here too, but this was actually a surprise January release. That didn't suck. This film took essentially what is my greatest fear being the unknown deep black water and magnified it. It had some very cool action set pieces. It had some characters that weren't stupid. It had really great tension in it. Admittedly, it was a very good theater going experience. If you watch it at home, I definitely suggest that you turn off all the lights, put your surround sound up to maximum, and then just dig in and fully focus on it because that is the best way you can get that experience that I got in the movie theater. It was a very fun movie to watch at the beginning of this year. My God. January 2020 feels like a fucking lifetime ago. Number six is Sound of Metal. This was Riz Amid's 
film about a, a drummer from a metal band who starts to lose his hearing and almost goes completely deaf. This film was a very hard-hitting film. It was a very personal film. And also it has some very good sound mixing and sound editing. I really hope that it's on the table for at least one of those categories. It really put you in the shoe of someone who's going into this. Also how it sounds to just be losing your hearing. I was very, very appreciative of that experience because it gave you such an eye-opening really just ear popping kind of experience into that number five is extraction i'm surprised no one's talked about this movie because this was a really solid action movie non-stop action once it got started it also was a pretty seamless blend of hollywood and bollywood it didn't try to make it obvious it didn't try to make it overhanded it didn't make it like a, a cultural thing or something of a political thing. It was just like, hey, yeah, this is where the movie takes place in India, which is going to have Indian actors in here. And bam, 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 shoot, shooty. And it was really fun. I, I really enjoyed it. It's a really fun action movie that has some great elements and some great twists in it. So yeah, that's why it's number five. Number four is I'm going to be cheating here. This is a portrait of a lady on fire. I watched this movie at the Victoria Film Festival back in February. And technically speaking, this movie was in so many goddamn film circuits that it wasn't really released until this year, officially. Yeah, it's kind of a stretch. But I'd heard so much hype about this movie. And yes, it is a beautifully made film. It is a wonderfully acted film. It is a fantastically empowering movie that focuses on its story and making a good movie rather than having, say, like that terrible black Christmas movie where it was just <coughs> over the head with just adder stupidity and just shooting your message rather than actually making your film. This film was made by a politically driven director, but she doesn't put that as the focus. She made a goddamn good movie that should have been up on the cinematography table. It still would have lost to Roger Deakins, but it was such a beautiful movie. It's big negative though was that it was very very long and it did drag a lot it was a beautifully shot film it was a wonderfully acted film and it's a very good empowering film for women and just women working in film in general number three is the invisible man now for all those higher uppies and whatever who just were like boo how do you put the invisible man above the portrait of lady on fire blah, 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 blah. well it's because Invisible Man was, uh, it wasn't boring. The Invisible Man actually should have been fucking terrible in all honesty. It was directed by the guy who did Upgrade, who has definite experience writing horror films, some of them bad, but he also has a little bit of directorial experience. He used that and cheap budget means to make a film about an invisible dude actually scary. Probably one of the best parts about the film is the cheapest technique you could ever use, which is literally just focusing on something that isn't even there. Like that poster right there. Just zoom in slowly on that. You wouldn't believe how well that was used to make it look scary. Elizabeth Moss embodied you in her horror, her fear, her tension. And even with all the stupid shit that does happen in this movie, I was still thoroughly entertained. I was gripped to my seat. And I thought that this was a really well done low budget horror film. A Blumhouse horror movie that's actually good. That's becoming a rare thing now, isn't it? Number two is The Trial of the Chicago 7. Aaron Sorkin is just a master of heavy dialogue films and this film is no different from his previous work being Molly's Game. It's a great period piece in terms of talking about such a pivotal moment in American history and it's wonderfully acted by everyone. Sasha Baron Cohen's great in it, Eddie Redmayne's good in it, uh, Mark Rolf, oh, I can't pronounce his name, but he's fantastic in it. Everyone gives solid performances. Everyone gives fantastic delivery. The script is just top notch and the pacing and the editing are very, very well done. It's not a perfect movie, but it's pretty damn good. And now for number one, it's a tie. I'm gonna use that little cheat that I said earlier about movies being released this year. 1917, this movie came out in January of this year and God damn it, I'm gonna give it the appreciation it deserves. This was a fucking fantastic movie. I went out and bought the 4K the instant it came out cause I knew this movie was goddamn good and I wanted to watch it at home. And every time I have started that movie, I have not stopped to do anything. I haven't looked at my phone. I haven't gone to the bathroom. I haven't gone to eat something. When I put this movie on, I am fixed 
to my seat until it is done. The camera work by Roger Deakins is fantastic. The direction by Sam Mendes was phenomenally well done. The actors greatly portray the world and the conflict that they were in. And the film just puts you in their shoes. It's like you are literally alongside them throughout the whole film. And that's one of the reasons why it's just such a goddamn marvelous movie. And it's one of the best film going experiences I've had in a long goddamn time. And, and you can bet I'm holding on to that while the whole thread of theaters going completely extinct is looming all over all of us. I, I really hope theaters don't die. And then the other tie forward first place is another round. This was a really good movie to end the year on. Now you might be wondering, what the hell is this movie? Well, this was a film that came out this year. It was released in Denmark. It has Mads Mikkelsen in it. And it's about four teachers who feel that they're completely stuck in their lives. They just have no forward purpose and they're just kind of fading away from what they used to be. And so they start drinking at school as an experiment. And it is a great film, not just in terms of storytelling or character development, but also in terms of awakening you to a different style of culture. The legal drinking age in Denmark is 15, and it's a very incorporated part of their culture and their history. And this film uses those elements, all the while being a very somber film about life and about trying to find something that will reawakens you, whether it be alcohol, life experiences are just reconnecting with those who you lost that connection with. I would very heavily recommend you watch it. Don't watch an English dub of it though because I imagine they bobbly butcher the the language. Just watch it. It's, it's really really good. You're going to enjoy it if you can find it that is. I mean, it is a worthy contender for number one and that is why it is my tie for number one of the year. And that's my list. Thank you guys for watching. Sorry if I dragged on a little bit. Admittedly 2020 was a very weird year. But let's hope that going into 2021, first, movie theaters reopen up here. And two, things kind of go back to normal. And we can go back to movie theaters and movies get released normally. However, I do hope that film festivals keep doing the digital thing because admittedly I completely spaced on doing it this time. If I were able to watch what's at the Toronto Film Festival digitally, that would be... That'd be cool! Anyways guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. This is the last one of 2020, so... Woo! Let's get on to 2021. Thank you guys so much for watching my videos. Thank you so much for all of the comments and the likes and everything you guys have given me this year. For those of you who didn't know, I am in the process of creating a Patreon account, so you will be seeing an announcement about that. So if any of you guys would like to support this channel in any way, that would be really, really cool. Anyways, that's all from me, guys. See you guys next year. If any of you are wondering why Tenon is on this list, is because it's not that fun. It's just not a fun movie for me. It's a cool tech film, but I just didn't dig it as much as other people seem to have.